couple slides. I just have a couple slides, and then um, it's basically going to be a live demo for my lab area. So a lot of hands on here. <clears throat> So when it comes to automation, I was attending a seminar one time and, and then the one speaker said this, you know, your thought process is the most powerful automation tool you ever have. And that's something to think about, you know, no matter what product that you want to use to do automation, today we're going to talk about VMware Aria, but I still feel that whoever's doing the automation, that your thought process is the most powerful part of it. Since I never spoke at the Philly VMUG before, here's a little, little bit about me. I'm a TAM and I'm part of the, the VMware V Expert program, which is a really good program if, if you get into presenting or blogging or something like that. And there's some links if you wanna reach out to me on Twitter afterwards or um, go look at my blog site. I have that listed and you know the attitude I always take with automation basically is if you can script it, you can you can automate it. So my background, I I just joined VMware last summer, and before that, this was my focus. You know, automation operations, log insights, as a customer. So a lot of a lot of that I'm going to show today is what I did as a customer. So the topics yeah for this presentation. We're going to talk about ARIA automation operations, a little bit about the automation config, which is salt. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of start out the agenda showing, you know, here's what it looks like. We're going to build some new VMs and then we're going to deep dive into how to make that work. I'm going to show you all my configuration that I have set up in my lab. So hopefully that part will be a little more interesting for everybody. So yeah, so now we're gonna, that was it for slides. And um, it's like I always say with automation, there's a hundred ways to do the same thing. So what I'm gonna demo will maybe give you some tips and tricks and maybe you'll learn something that you can transfer back to your environment. So let's get into the demo. So if you haven't used ARIA automation before, um, or vRealize Automation, if people still remember that name. Uh, this is the log on screen. <clears throat> so as an end user, and what I, want, what I want to do is I'm going to show you how you can use this to create VMs on-prem, or in my when I say about doing it on cloud, on cloud, I do have an Azure account, and I'm going to show how you can do VMs in Azure or different flavors of VMs all within the same product. <clears throat> so to kind of show you what you can do within ARIA automation to start, I have a couple Azure VMs, some Windows, some Rocky Linux, some Ubuntu. But when it comes to what you can do with these VMs, like day, day two type of steps, make this a little bigger here. Um, if you click on your VMs, if you come over here to actions, you can add disks, you can delete disks, um, you can do reboots, resizing, restarts, all these steps. So, you know, when I was a customer of VMware, one of our goals was to, to let application teams kind of create their own VMs, but don't give them access to vCenter or give them access to the Azure management area. If, if you define everything properly and you set up these blueprints and the catalog items that you can allow the people to do all the creations in all these different areas. And I'm showing Azure, but I could just as easy do AWS or Google or any of the cloud providers that VMware supports. So here's some of the different things you can do that, that people would say, hey, I need access to the management console for you can do that within ARIA automation. And even on-prem, if I go and look at one of my Windows servers, you know, you click on the VM, come over here to the actions, you can allow your app team to, you know, do something. And you can control what they can do. If you say, hey, I don't want to let them add disks or something, there's policies that you can put in place that if all you want to do is allow them to do reboots or maybe snapshots, a couple steps, you, you can limit what they have access to do. 
So as as the end user, once you once you get your processes set up, let's just go create some VMs. So we're going to go into my Azure catalog item, and let's create a new one. We'll just do number five. I created some earlier today so that I could populate VROPs and show you how that works. But what's really neat with Azure VMs is I could I could make this a Ubuntu server or a Windows server. So you could have a simple drop down, ask a couple questions and create these servers. So let's do the uh, Ubuntu server first. And then you can ask all types of questions. I'm just asking one for now, but if there's certain things that you wanna do that as part of your creating servers, you can have an even like disk size. You're gonna have a drop down to say, Here's the sizes that I'm going to allow you to create for your data disks. So let's go create a Azure VM. Now, why that's creating, we can just let's go kick off another Azure VM, but we'll do Windows this time. So if I change this to Windows, well, maybe we'll do a little bit bigger on the data disk, and we're going to do monthly patching and hit submit. So within within one, you know, my whole focus today is to show you how within one environment that you how you can do these. So let's let's go create a on-prem server now. So this would be talking to vCenter. So if we're going to create a Windows server, it's going to be a 2019. Um, here's my VM name. And let's say you want to give it three different data drives. So let's just make 10. 11, 12. And if you tell it it's a SQL server, it'll format the drives with 64K allocation versus the, to the normal 4K. So you can ask all those types of questions on your catalog item to do that. So we'll kick that off. So I wanted to do this first. So we'll let these servers kind of build in the background and then we'll go and look at some other pieces that I wanted to show. So in, in addition to having the automation piece be able to talk to any type of environment, you can do the same thing with VROPs. So here's a dashboard that I created that I wanted to show today. So in this dashboard, I like to show these donut charts to show health and stuff. So it's showing the vCenter health. It's showing all the hosts. If any host would be in maintenance mode, you would see the colors change. It's showing the memory usage. And if you click on any of these colors, it'll kind of show you which host is having some memory usage. It's getting a little higher. But then I also wanted to show how with if you have that single dashboard, you wake up in the morning, you sign in, and you want to see how your environment's going. You know, I'm showing on-prem, but then I'm also saying, all right, here's all my Azure VMs. And as, as those VMs are being created in the background right now, they will eventually show up here. Let's see if any of them showed up yet. Not yet. <clears throat> and then some of the nice things that VROPS does with, with Azure VMs, if you click on one of these, if you look at this relationship chart, it shows you here's my disks. It shows you here's the NIC that is in Azure. It shows how I'm, this is my resource group that I created in. Here's my job, my deployment name from VRA. Um, shows that you're on the east. So I was building this in Azure East. It shows all that information. It kind of shows you the relationship between your VMs in Azure and where they're located. But then on the same screen, to show that same kind of data, if you come to an on-prem VM, same thing. It's showing, you know, here's my storage. Here's all the, you know, folder that it's located in. Um, any groups that I was, it was part of, any tag with, like, there's the environment, um, the host that it's running on. So it shows all that data. <clears throat> so instead of having to go back and forth between different dashboards, if if all the things that you want to see will fit, you can put it on one data. Or like here in Azure, I'm showing my resource group 
shows the health. It shows you how many VMs that I have. It's the, you know, one thing that people like to watch is, hey, did, did somebody create a VM with a public IP? If they did, you can make the colors turn red. You know, if that was at zero, it would be green. But then at the same time, I'm showing on my own prem. Here's all my hosts, my my servers, everything that it takes or everything that exists in that environment. Now, to make that work, let's, let's dive into this a little bit. So if we go under the assembly piece of ARIA automation, go to infrastructure, there's an integrations in cloud accounts down at the bottom. So for cloud accounts, you can see I have an Azure account, and then I also have my, my vCenter. So if I click on this, you know, it'll ask you to set up, you know, what's the name of your vCenter, your username and password, and you can validate things, and then you can pick which data center you want to use. And that's what makes the connection from VRA into your vCenter. And then if you have Azure, here, I'll show you what it looks like here. If you add Azure, it's going to, it's different names because now you're going to a cloud account. So you, it's asking for your subscription ID, your tenant ID, some of these security keys that you need to do for Azure. And even with, um, let me show you with AWS, different questions. But one, once you put in the information and makes that connection, <clears throat> VRA will reach out to those providers and start pulling in hey, here's the different locations, you know, like Azure East or Central or West that you can build in and all the different templates that are available. And that's what I'll show you here. So for like image mappings, image mappings is telling, if it's on-prem, it's telling vCenter which template to use. But if you're building in Azure, you can define um, the templates that are built into Azure. So if I show you Azure first, you can see that I'm going to go Azure East and here's the name of the template that I want to use for my Ubuntu builds. So you define that and then I'll show you in the cloud templates where that comes into play. But then if you're doing on-prem, you then say, all right, here's my vCenter. Here's my template name. And then you 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 define those. And if you had AWS accounts and you wanted to also define those and to try to come up with a naming scheme, like anything Azure, you know, I put AZ in front of it. You know, if it's AWS, you could call it AWS and whatever templates that you wanted to use to build your VMs. You know, I don't care where the VMs. Once you make the connections and you define these pieces, when, when you go to build things, as long as you have everything defined correctly, it'll work. Like even with flavor mappings. On prem, I was doing the t-shirt size. So if you go small, that says one, one gig of memory, one CPU. But if you look at Azure, if you say Azure small, now you have to start picking, here's the size of the server. Since you can't get specific on CPU and memory in Azure, you have to go pick a size. So I said, all right, anything Azure small, I'm gonna standardize to say standard B1S. And the same thing with network. You know, here's, here's my on-prem network. You kind of go through and you define your networks to say, here's the, the the VLAN that I'm using, you know, here's here's your IP information, the subnet information. You define that, and then with Azure, same thing. You go out and say, all right, here's the network that I'm going to use, and here's my IPs to use for that network. And cloud zones. So I so I'm. You, let's say you had Azure, then you were going to build East and West. You could define e, each one of those. So under East, you can see that, that I spelled it out to say, hey, I want to use Azure East. And then it'll ask you which ones, and you can select um, which, which one you want to do. 
But then on prem, what I was doing is virtual private zones. If you're if you're not familiar with those, so in a virtual virtual private zone, you can go through and say, all right, here's the folder I want it to go to in vCenter. My compute is going to go to this cluster. My storage is going to use this data store. I want it to be thin. And then you can also specify which network. So with a VPZ, you can kind of define all of those. And I'll show you in the cloud template how you can call that out, that you're defining everything within one VPC to make that work. Now within VRA, they have what they call projects. Um, projects can be used different ways. When I was a customer, the way we used projects was like for each application team. So if I created a, you know, project um, called, you know, HR applications, you could define everything that's related to HR. And then when you allow the, the users to get into VRA, when you put them in that project, that's all they see. They would only see those VMs. So it's a way to keep things separated between your users. In my demo, I'm, I'm doing a project for Azure and I'm doing a project for, for on-prem. You, you could definitely take that a step further and, and have it for each application team in each, each area. To, to, to show you what a project looks like then, is you add your users. So I added myself as the user. And there's the provisioning. You know, I, I had that cloud zone that I defined, which was Azure East. And if you want to automatically add some tags or do some custom naming and stuff, you can define everything that you want to use for that project. Now, if you look at my on-prem, so to do VMs, the project's a little, little different. You know, you still add your users, but then I'm saying use that virtual private zone. So that way, when you build for this project, it's going to, this zone is what tells it, here's what storage, my networking, my CPU, it defines all that. And then here's an example. I just had a tag out there that I, that I created to make sure that it works. It says, all right, anything that's in this zone, you could have tags that have the applications that you're going to install. Um, you, the tags could be for anything, you know. That, that you want to define to be able to quickly group things together. Now, where you use all that information is in VRA is what they call cloud templates. So a cloud template, we'll start with the Azure one. I mean, mine's kind of simple. You can definitely get a little bit more complicated than this, but let's make this a little bigger. So on the left here, you have all the different resources. So I took and I dropped on the Azure VM, but then I wanted to add a second drive to it to use for data storage. So I dropped that onto my cloud template. And when you, when you put these, different resources onto your cloud template. Here's all the different things that you can define. I can say, all right, you know, I, I want a public assigned IP in my lab area, since I don't have a VPN from, you know, normally in, a, in most environments, you won't do that. But I, I wanted to be able to connect into them since I don't have that VPN between my lab and Azure. So I did say, hey, I want to, public IP, you know, define your user information, image, you know, where I was showing you the image and there, 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 it says image, and that's a question that I ask. So that becomes an input. So at the top here, you define your inputs where you can say VM name, you know, what size, here's everything I had defined, you know, that patching question, all that comes from your, your YAML code for the cloud template. And to make that a Ubuntu or Windows, you know, it says, all right, here's here's my options, data drives. And then the resource group that I want to build that in Azure, 
I, I hard coded that one in my YAML code, but that way it knows, hey, when it when it talks to Azure, here's the resource group that I'm going to go to. And then the VM name is based off of the questions. And then this the attached disk there again is because of what you define here. So when you pick on the disk, it's saying that the capacity is based on how you answer that on that catalog item. <clears throat> so that's why I, want, I wanted to show you what the catalog items look like first and then show you the code of what made that work. And we can go back to the catalog items after I show this. So if we look at my cloud template for doing on-prem, it's a little different. Because in Azure, stuff like the networking is controlled by your resource group. It's all predefined. So I said, use this resource group. But yet, if, if I'm building on-prem, now you need to define some of those types of questions. So if you look at the VM, you come over and look at my YAML code. You know, all these inputs are questions that I'm asking at the top of the YAML code. You know, what's the drive sizes? You know, what's the... IP number. I was making these static. Where in Azure, my, that when I defined that network, that was um, using DHCP. But here, I wanted them to be static. And then you can see, you know, when you define, I wanted to be able to do three different hard drives in addition to what the VM had. And you can see in my code as I click on these different um, resources, it'll highlight the YAML code. And if you kept that at zero, if you look at this where it says count, if I kept the size at zero, it doesn't create it. So if the size is zero, then the count is zero and it'll never create that drive. As long as you give that drive size some number, it will then add that as a drive letter. Because maybe you're creating just a simple web server and everything is going to be on the C drive. So you could keep all these at zero and it doesn't create any additional drives. If you're building a SQL server and you want your data drive and your temp drive and your log files to be on different drives, you can design your cloud template to, to do that. But you, by doing a size of zero, it's, you can control whether they get created or not. And then to use the salt stack um, resource, I put that on to my cloud template. And this will say, all right, here's here's my salt server. You know, here's the state files, and I'll I'll show you that later. <clears throat> what a, what a state file does is defines, like if you want certain services to be enabled or disabled or auto running, or if you want to change registry value, any anything that you're a state is how you're configuring that server. So at time of build, I can tell salt, all right. After the build's done, go and in, go and run these state files. And then you can define grain data at the same time. And if, to help people that aren't familiar with salt, the grain data is it's, it's, it's a text file that lives on your on your servers. And it's like a little database. It says, you know, you could save information. Like you can say, here's the roles that it is. Or when I'm doing the build, whatever value you pick for these different drives, I'm saving that in the grain data because when this state file runs to create the new drives, to format it, I look to see if SQL equals true, I will format the drive with 64K allocation. If SQL is false, then it just keeps it at 4K. So by, add, by asking these questions, you can add a lot of logic to your state files to control how the server is built. So yeah, if you look at if you look at these inputs and stuff, we come back to the broker piece of VRA. Let's go into the Windows server. Those inputs are what become the questions that are asked on your custom form. So if I keep the, these all these at zero, it's never going to create the drive. And then I try, I try to put that information on the custom form so that whoever's running this process can see that. Or even like here, I tell them why, if it's true. And you can control like the font colors and stuff. With custom forms, you can do um, 
CSS files that when you when you know the value of this in your custom form, you can say make the color red or make it a certain size or certain font, something to kind of catch the eyes of your end users when they're going to build servers. So if we look at the Azure one again, to hopefully help tie all the pieces together, you can see, you know, here's the size that I had. So they were inputs in my YAML code, you know, all the disk sizes, that was what was inputs in my, in my YAML code. So let's go see if those servers are, are done that we started. So the Azure ones are done. but the uh, one on-premise still building. <clears throat> so as, as easy it is to create stuff that's in Azure or on-prem, so let's take this first one here. Let's say this server needs to be decomped. So instead of you having to go out to Azure and delete the VM and the drives and the NIC and anything that was created, I can come into here and pick delete. And this is now going to go out to Azure and remove that VM. And if you're not familiar with Azure, let me pull up a screen here. It shows. So here in Azure, you can see, so now that I'm deleting those disks, some stuff will disappear, but you can see all the different objects, the VMs, the public IP address, the disk, everything that it created. And then what, what VRA does is it does add some tags that shows information that VRA needs to keep around about the VMs. But but the nice part, that's where I'm saying the nice part about this is all the stuff that you would sometimes have to open up permission for people to see. If you define your resource groups and stuff in Azure and you make that connection with VRA, you don't need to let your users have that access. And, and that's every every place is different, you know. If you still want to give your users permission to that, that's fine. But by creating these catalog items and defining all your networks and stuff in VRA, it just makes it so that that you don't have to do that. Because maybe maybe all your server builds are being done by your level one engineers, and maybe level three engineers would have the access into your management console in Azure. But for for um, your engineers that are just doing some simple builds, you create this nice catalog of different processes that you need to do and let let them run them let them let them build stuff on prem in azure you know aws if i want to go build a ubuntu server you know here's a quick catalog item for that day two operations in vra you know i have some examples where i run powershell scripts to do certain things and you can do stuff like that in vra and i have a powershell host in my lab that i can ask certain questions and or even if you're doing ansible you know i have some um catalog item that you can even go through and I think it's like rocky ones you can even say hey, which which playbook do i want to run so rocky linux is a, a different flavor that's out there and you can say all right when i'm building my server i want to make this a rocky web server so now there's a playbook that it would run at the end of the build to make that a web server. If it's a database server, it would do all the installation and stuff for, for a database server. So let's go look at VROPS. Let's do a refresh, see if it picked up those new VMs. Yep. So here's like that one VM we created that was Linux. And here's the Here's that Windows one that I created. So you can see here's, you know, same, same data. So from one, one, one dashboard, as you create new VMs, 
it's going to pull those in and, and show you all the information that you need to to do for um, displaying those. Now, the one the one thing I'm doing with my on-prem Windows servers is I'm also adding the salt minion to that at the time of the build. And what if you haven't ever seen salt, let's go into that. So salt.config, it's part of the vRealize suite. If you have the automation piece, you have salt stack. And what salt stack allows you to do is to create like state files that define what that server is. You can do software installations, you know, certain settings that you want, um, like registry settings, anything, you know, if you want to make sure that if it's a, um, if it's not a print server, as an example, always keep your spooler service disabled. And I'll show you some, some examples of that. So what you can do in salt is you can create what they call targets. And you can define different targets because if you're if you're making a configuration change and maybe you only want to do it to you know your Rocky Linux servers or your Ubuntu or maybe your web servers, maybe there's a change just to, to go against your web servers, you define that. So when I click on this, it'll only show me anything that was that I had defined as a web server. If you come back to your target and you're saying only show me. If I'm from the department VMware, as an example, it's only going to run against these two servers. So what you what you can do is you can create what they call jobs, um, and the jobs can can run any function that Salt has available. <clears throat> A simple example is to add the grain data. So, you know, I can I come into here. And I say, hey, it's a function it's for grains. I'm going to append the department VMware. So I put that in my title. The function that it's going to run, it says grains.append. The argument is department, but the value is going to be VMware. If you look at the functions, there's all kinds of functions built into salt. Um, and if you haven't used salt, you know, it's something you could look at and kind of see all the different functions that are built in. And if there's not a function to do what you want, and that's one of my examples I'm going to show is you can write a script. You know, if you're a Windows admin and you want to be able to make changes and you have a PowerShell script that already exists in your environment, and you want to kick that off, you can make that a function. If you're doing Linux servers and you have some scripts or whatever you want to do, you can you can make that a function. So if you look at the, under the file server section of salt, these, like this is in, in my cloud template where I defined everything. I said, I run it, I wanted to run these two state files. So if you look at this state file, what this says is it's going to stop a service. So the function to do that is called service.dead and then you pass it the service name. So I wanted to make sure that the spooler service was stopped. And then I also wanted to make sure that the service was disabled so it would never run again, even on a restart. So you can say service.disabled, you pass it the service name and it'll disable that service. So when you define these state files, there's a schedule section, we'll show you that. You can have that be applied to your server, you know, every day or every hour, whatever, whatever makes sense to your organization. If it's important to keep this closed or to, you know, keep that service stopped and not running, you know, make sure that it, that it's um, run maybe every day, you know, early in the morning or whatever, whatever makes sense. So here's an example of a, running a PowerShell script in a Windows environment. So I created this script that when I add those new, when you add new drives in VRA, it'll add the drives and it'll put it in vCenter, it adds it to your VM, but it doesn't format the drives for you. So in order to format the drive, 
I wanted to have a script. And then I also wanted the drive to be formatted different, whether it was a regular server or a SQL server. So if we go and look where this says salt scripts, Windows server, if you look up here at the folder structure, here's my script. So here's a PowerShell script that I go and pull in the values of all the different sizes from the grain data. So that where that grains dot get, I'm pulling in all those values. And if it's a SQL server, I'm pulling in that. So then I make a decision then, you know, <clears throat> based on the grain data, you know, how to format. So if you notice when I'm bringing up the, those drives online, you know, in, I bring it online and I format it and I do all that through through PowerShell. And even here, you can see if it's true, my allocation unit size is 64K. If it's false, then it does 4K. So if you have existing scripts in your environment and you want to start using some of the more advanced features of SALT, um, you, can, you can do that. And what you do is you write the script in a way that as if you're going to run it from that server. <clears throat> Before SALT, I used to write a lot of scripts running from like a PowerShell host where I would reach in, I would, I would connect in the vCenter and I would grab VM names and I would pull it into my script and do like a for each loop. And it would say, all right, this VM, I'm gonna to go touch, you know, connect to it. I'm gonna make these changes. With salt, when you define your targets and you have some states like this that you would wanna run, if it's, if it's one VM or a thousand VMs, salt will push that job down to all those at the same time. And it's, it's very fast. So if you haven't ever looked at salt, um, I, I would recommend to take a look at it sometime. So we covered a lot of data in a pretty short amount of time. Is there any questions from anybody before I continue? Any, anybody have any thoughts? Anybody want to go off mute or I can look to see if there's anything in the chat. If you want to throw some questions out in the chat. Um, hopefully this is helping some people. <clears throat> the one thing I wanted to, to also show today, it's kind of related um, to the topic. Um, I had a customer recently ask me if, they could see RV tools data within VROPS. So I don't know if people, I know a lot of VI admins, VMware admins that use RV tools. It's a program that you can download and it'll connect to vCenter and pull in all the information about the servers, the VMs, the hosts. And there's a tab that's called vHealth that'll show like zombie files, inconsistent folder names and stuff like that. And they're like, we want to use VROPS as our single pane of glass type of environment, but we also want to be able to see some stuff that RV Tools collects. So what I did is I created a, an RV Tools dashboard in VROPS that pulls in the, what, what RV Tools does is it creates an Excel, it's a spreadsheet file. If, well, here, let me pull that up. So this is RV Tools. I don't know people on the call every so each one of these tabs shows you different information about your environment and then there's one that's called be health and they wanted to see this as something to monitor within vrops so what i did is i i created a script that automatically runs rv tools creates a spreadsheet file it reads the spreadsheet file into the script and I create a web page for each one of these tabs. So then you can kind of pick and choose which tabs you would want to see in VROPS. So I'm showing, you know, vHealth, vInfo. And this is done using what they call the text display widget within VROPS. So if you, let's go edit this dashboard. So there's a text display widget that you can put onto your dashboard when you're doing custom dashboards. And when you define that, 
widget, you give the path to where I saved those HTML files. So like for RV tools, I created one for vHealth. So I, I define that here. And then when you look at the dashboard, it pulls in anything that is designed on or displayed, you know, defined, it shows that. And if you want to quickly go to like your zombie files, you start typing in the search and here's all your zombie files. If the customer wanted to see inconsistent disk or folder names, boom, you can start searching. Or as an option, if you wanted to create a, a widget area that also just only shows those, you could you could actually break out what you wanted and do some filtering and only show those. So I don't know if there's any RV tool fans on the call, but I just thought I would show that. It's kind of a nice way to automate that whole process and have you know VROFs be that single pane of glass that you can show data in VROPS, that's not data that, that you get out of vCenter, but I, I feel that it's data that's still important to kind of monitor your environments. So if there's ever any interest to that, I would, um, I'm probably gonna write a blog post about this. I haven't done it yet. So keep an eye on my blog website. I do have this script and I don't mind sharing this and I'm probably gonna put it out there soon. So, um, Any questions from anybody? Any thoughts? Was this hopefully hopefully I was able to share some some knowledge and maybe gave you some quick tips and tricks and show you how how that whole multi you know when you hear VMware talk about the whole multi cloud you know I'm my goal was to hope hopefully help people learn how you can create Azure VMs on prem in the cloud monitor you know, in the cloud, on-prem, all with the same set of tools. You see any, I don't see any questions, Ed. Are you seeing anything in the chat or anything? Um, oh, Steve, thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Thanks for taking the time to join today. Yeah, I don't. I don't see any uh, questions or anything. Yeah, I know we covered covered a lot of stuff <laughs> within a within hours time. Um, yeah. If if somebody would ever want to, you know, do certain sections in future VMUGs to kind of maybe not cover quite as much, just reach out to Ed and I, you know, I could um, do something in the future. Or if you go out to my blog site and um, have questions or see some, some stuff, just send me an email. You know, I could always, I'm always willing to help anybody that that's a part of the VMUG and part of the whole V community. And I do share a lot of code out there in my blog site. So you go, if you want to go out there and I can pull that up quick. Yeah. If you can uh, drop it in the chat. If you have your blog link and um, contact information. Yeah. Just Thanks. for everybody to see. Thanks. Just remember Crocs. It's V Crocs. You know, a lot of a lot of people that do VMware stuff put a V in front of you know, like V brisket or or V whatever. People, some people make fun of me wearing Crocs all the time. So I created a site called V Crocs. And um, I, I had a guest um, blogger last week, Dave. He's he's a fellow Tam with myself and wanted to get into writing some information. So I told him I would share it. Um, I was on a podcast two weeks ago um, and I'm promoting this talk today. So if you want to go out and you know, where I was showing all that information about how to work with Windows Server drives, you know, I did blog about that. And if you go out and look, a lot of the screens I just showed you are in that. And I, I do have the uh, the YAML code out there if you want to go and copy and paste and 
<clears throat> I would always say, make sure you understand the code before you put it into production. And if you'd ever have any questions, um, don't be afraid to reach out to me on email or like I said, on Twitter, anything you wanna do. So I try to write about stuff I find interesting. My role as a TAM now, what, what has been happening is as customers come to me with questions that I find very interesting and I come up with a solution for them, I'll, I'll actually write a blog post to share with the community then. So that's kind of where I get a lot of my content or the topics for my content. And what I, what, you know, I, when I reached out to Ed, you know, one thing I thought that was interesting is I see a lot of demos that talk about the cloud, but then they don't cover on-prem or they'll talk about on-prem and not talk about cloud. So my goal, and I hope, I hope I came across that way, is to kind of show you how you can do both with the same tools. So you don't have to use different products for different, different environments. All right, we're going to stop the recording, but we can continue on. Uh...